wherever you may be around the world. And thank you for joining us once again on truth to you.org. That's truth number two, letter you.org. I'm Jono and joining me is Mr. Spiritual Babies. G'day, my friend. Good evening, Jono. Did you enjoy last week's program? Oh, man, I did. You know what? And I excellent. went to bed and I, and I, 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 I felt salty. You felt salty? I did. And you did. You did an excellent job on the uh, on the video, by the way. Well done. Oh, that was for, well, it was great. very easy to do with such fantastic pictures. Fantastic pictures. Again, uh, the website is www.outreachjudaism.org. Outreachjudaism.org is the website where you will find Rabbi Tobias Singer's ever so challenging and in-depth Bible study entitled Let's Get Biblical, Why Doesn't Judaism Accept the Christian Messiah? We're going to be talking a little bit about that, I think, today, if we get time. It's available in audio, DVD, and a hardcover study guide. Welcome back to the program, Aquaman, Rabbi Tobias Singer. It's great to be back, guys. It's uh, wonderful to be here. And, and the show couldn't have been that bad, couldn't have been a disaster, because you're having me back. So it, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a total disaster. <laughs> now, speaking of shows that you seem to come back to, can, can we just do a plug for Israel National Radio for a second? Because on uh, with, with Tamar Yona, uh, you do the TNT program. You're still doing that, right? You guys are still doing that on Israel National Radio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, Tamar, uh, a wonderful young woman. We, uh, we've we been doing that show for more than a decade on Israel National Radio together, mm. exploring the news, the events that are quickly unfolding before our eyes. Um, I think uh, prophetic, I mean, there are so many texts in the Jewish scriptures. I can't say that don't make sense, but now we can understand what they mean. Whereas 300 years ago, they were studying Ezekiel and Zechariah, and they had to be scratching their head and going, well, I know God is going to do this, but I have no clue how it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We now know. We now know. We, we have the, the uh, benefit of, of seeing how prophecies are being fulfilled. And you discuss some of those things on, on that program. So that's, now, correct me if I'm wrong, IsraelNationalRadio.com? Yeah. Okay. And uh, and you let everybody know, by the way, you do let everybody know when you are going on air. You can find Tobias Singer on Facebook. Yeah, you can look him up there and uh, you keep people up to date when you are going on the air. So it's a handy thing as well. Uh, also on your Facebook page, you are letting people see some of the most spectacular photos that you were taking under the water. And these are some of the things that we discussed last week. We said we were going to return to Ezekiel chapter 47 this week. But before we do, do you have a featured uh, little critter for us or creature to, to uh, behold? Yeah, I, uh, there's one unusual creature that I have never uh, shown publicly. Uh, this is the first, and it's a... Uh, it's a a, a mantis shrimp. Now that doesn't sound very exciting, but it, it's first of all very pretty to look at. Extraordinary colors. It has these eyes that move independently. Uh, it has is considered to have the best vision of any creature on Earth. But that's not what makes it so astounding. Uh, the mantis shrimp, the one I one I photographed, it's, it was a night dive in Indonesia. Crawled out uh, from under a rock has a very unusual weapon. In fact, there's nothing else like it in the world. It has a claw that it could release at such high speed, literally faster than a, than a bullet. It, it, the claw explodes out, hits its prey at a speed of 23 meters per second. 23 so meters a second? 23 meters per second, faster than a 22 caliber bullet. And it, it hits the it hits its prey, which is often a, a lobster or a, or an oyster or any of these crustaceans, and literally smashes it to pieces. And uh, and then it just eats it. Then it just eats the inside. It's very very powerful. This animal is so powerful. The claw shoots out at such speed. There is no creature in the world that can launch uh, an appendage at that kind of speed. Um, is so powerful that you can't keep it in an ordinary aquarium. It's very colorful, very pretty, but you need bulletproof glass for the aquarium because it will smash through an aquarium's, the regular glass on an aquarium. So, um, and, and that's what it does. So it, it shoots out this bullet, but this bullet is its claw. It smashes into its prey. It blows its shell to pieces and then it just devours the entire thing. But that is unbelievable. It, have, I mean, it, have you actually seen the claw in action? I mean, have you seen that happen? No, no. It's, it's you know, one of the things that uh, is, is all divers crave to see, and maybe I'll put that up soon, but it's rare, is to actually witness what's called predation, to actually see 
uh, to watch, to observe the actual event of how it's happening. So it's it's rare for that to for that to occur within vision. And even if you get to see predation, things happen under the water in such a split second that unless your camera is right there locked in, like I, I happened to be when I had those two uh, yellowtail snappers kissing. I just happened to have the camera right there, right on the money and able to grab that money shot. Wow. Now, for scientists, this raised a a very unusual question because this mantis shrimp played a role in the war in Iraq for the for the coalition forces. And you're going, <laughs> what? Now? Hang on a second. No, no, no. I, I, I've heard how how Mossad trained the sharks to to. Uh, you heard about that? Well, uh, yeah, to conduct shark that. attacks in what on the on the Egyptian coast. Was that right? <laughs> right at Charm. Right. There, there was. Uh, there were. That, that's the oceanic white tip that I we uh, we we that I. That I photograph extensively in the uh, southern part of the Red Sea. Mm-hmm. But, you see, the problem is this. The, 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 the problem for scientists was, okay, so the, it's able to launch this claw at a speed faster than, than a twenty two caliber mm-hmm. um, pistol or bullet. But the question is, of course, when, for every action, there's a reaction, meaning... This is a, a relatively small animal. I mean, for a shrimp, it's big. It's about a foot long. But how does it absorb the shock? How does oh, the body kickback. absorb the shock when it smashes an, an, an animal much larger than itself? How does it? its body has to then absorb that kind of shock? Why doesn't its claw simply smash its body to pieces by that kind of smack? I mean, how does it absorb that? If, if we took our fist and... Smash, it can literally smash through rocks in order to create a, a cave for itself in a coral. But the question is, how, how does the body, its body absorb that kind of the reaction? That's the big question. So for so, every reaction, there has to be a reaction. If you fire a gun, you feel it like, a, as you say, a twenty you You've got a, a rifle and you can feel it in the, in the shoulder. As the right. bullet is fired, your shoulder absorbs that impact, right? Right. Now, now, rifles are designed to recoil, have some sort of recoil in them. And that's why, um, you know, they're, it's, it's, it's not as intense. As, but this fish, this, this, technically it's not a fish, but this creature is, um, you know, what does it have? They examine it, the part where the claw touches the body, and what it has is this whole series of bone structure where one bone absorbs to the next bone, to the next bone, and spreads the, the, the punch that it receives back into a point where it almost feels nothing. So which means it's, it, the, the, the structure with the, uh, is just out, outrageous. With the, with, the, with the body is connected to this appendage, it has bone and bone and bone. I don't know if you've ever seen in, in, in Australia, but in the United States they have on the highways where they don't want you to, to uh, hit one of the, like a toll booth. So they have these cones, like sort of things that if you hit it, it, one would just fly into the next neck and just absorb all the energy. Well, that's what these animals have. They have a, a fabulous system of bone structure. Each one fits in the other, and it spreads the energy back, 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 until by the time the, it, it, it hits the shrimp, it almost has no energy that's pushing against the shrimp. That's what like a, like like a row of mattresses, a shock ex- uh, a shock like a of mattress, But each one fits in mm-hmm. the other, and it's sort of each one sort of spreads a little bit for the next, and just keeps absorbing it. It's 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 a bone structure rather than soft tissue. So it's a bone structure that spreads, spreads, and there's bone after bone, structure after structure that simply absorbs the shock until finally, by the time it reaches the animal, there's almost no shock. And what they did was they were able to use this technology created by God from the master of the universe, from the mind of God, and produce bulletproof vests. That were, because that was the big challenge in, in the coalition forces fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq is how do they produce a bulletproof vest that's lighter but is able to absorb the shock uh-huh. of, the, uh, uh, of a bullet? Mm. And they used the, 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 the model of this structure in order to create vests that were lighter and were able to absorb the shock 
of getting hit by by the bullet. So that is unbelievable. This thing actually has opened the world. It, it, it's it's an absolutely fascinating creature. It's a fascinating creature, and and Mr. Spiritual Babies. I mean, just looking at it, 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 not only does it, I mean, not only does it do these incredible things, but looking at it, it's spectacular. It's it's it looks like a rainbow. I gotta say, yeah, if if you have um, a twenty three meters per second punch. You can look however you want. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, that's yeah. true. <laughs> but our creator obviously made it look like it's. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I mean, Tobia, when you it, it, as a as a scuba diver, do you want to approach this thing uh, with caution? I mean, being the size that, that that we are, would it still have a go if it felt threatened? Uh, yeah, but you know, there's a general rule in diving, and that is that you don't touch things. Um, it's frowned upon. So therefore, everything we're there to watch, not to touch. There are, you know, you know, in Indonesia, there's probably be three thousand species. So many of them you encounter, you have no idea what it is, and then you study it when you come back on board because there's a whole series of encyclopedias on these ships that you literally live on for a week or two weeks, and you study them, learn about them, but you certainly don't want to touch things. Under the water, the the many of the animals have sort of a mucus around it that protects it, and by touching it, it removes that. So we we generally don't touch stuff, except for like sharks. That's something that people like to handle, like to touch because they have very unique skin texture. You, you told us last week that you were riding sharks. You grab onto that dorsal fin, yeah. and off you go. You can grab onto it, or if you, and one of the sharks that's easy to find are the whale sharks. It's the largest fish in the world. They grow to a length of probably about 50 feet, about the size of a school bus. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you why, but they, it's clear that these animals like being around people. And you'll see, you'll see many photographs or films on YouTube of people just holding on to the dorsal fin and just moving around and letting the shark take you. The shark, that shark, and there are not many, but that shark, for some reason, is very comfortable around human beings. It'll cut, even if you don't go near it, it will come up to you. It, I mean, I, I was diving and one came right under me and sort of um, saddled me where I was suddenly sitting on on top of it. And oh. its dorsal fill is enormous. I mean, it may go up, I, I'm just guessing, maybe three feet in the air. So you, you mean uh, above the above the fish. Uh -huh. So you almost have no choice but to be dragged along with this thing. Incidentally, for those listeners who are not familiar with the whale shark, they don't have teeth in the typical way. They eat, they eat plankton and organic material. Mm -hmm. Easy to find if you want to dive with them because they have uh, – because plankton eaters have a very specific migration trail, and therefore we know exactly where they're going to be at a specific time because they obviously follow the food. Mm -hmm. Right. They follow the jet stream, right? Well, they yeah. I mean, so, so we know, for example, I wanted to dive with them. So this past August, I went out to Cancun. Well, it's actually a little island off of Cancun. And then um, then we went down and uh, just dived with them. It is mind-boggling because uh, it means no matter what you see in a video, and you can see many videos of whale sharks, nothing, nothing could prepare, prepare you for the size, the girth of it is something like an I, I it's something like a seven thirty seven girth. It's just be, you're just looking at it and you just cannot believe wow. what you're seeing. It just it looks like something created in Disney. It just doesn't look real, but it is. But it is. Oh my goodness! And so once again, isn't our creator awesome? I mean, just some of the now you just just coming back to this incredible uh, shrimp. The eyes. You said that it has incredible uh, vision, and I'm looking yeah. at the eyes. What, what, uh, they, they look like they can, you know, look in different directions at once. Why, why is there? That's, why is its that, vision so incredible? That, that, well, you know, the eyes. They have um, their eyes are made up of basically six rows that that carry about sixteen different types of uh, of pigmentations, and they're able to pick up colors. We actually see in three dimensional because of the 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 module the makeup of the eyes. Uh, each eye is made up of uh, I think like ten thousand separate. Um, uh, it's called the omnitenda opposition type, which means the the eye is designed so that it could perceive wavelengths that we can't see. It could see ultraviolet light in wavelengths that we cannot perceive. 
and it could spot three dimen- spot things in a in a completely three dimensional fashion, and because the eyes are spread apart quite far, and you'll notice that they're extended, so the eyes can move apart very far, and as a result, you know, we see in two different dimensions because we our two eyes are apart. But theirs, in the ratio to the size of the body, are much further apart. They can perceive color variations that we could never perceive. It, it is regarded as um, as probably there, there's probably no creature in the world that has better vision and than this particular creature. It's, wow. it's, it's an absolutely astounding. Um, what an incredible it, it could, creature! It could uh, detect what's called uh, uh, circulatory um, polarizing light, things that we can't see. It's just a, an astounding wow. creature, just mind blowing. But it does smash hands; it smashes fingers. It's called the thumb smasher. <laughs> it's called the thumb smasher. Yeah, it literally can blow your hand, and it can blow your finger in two parts. So, if you didn't know about it, and you look, and you, I mean, you're you're down there, and you didn't have the experience, and you saw this thing, and you went, "Oh wow, look at this! It's so beautiful!" and reached out your hand, you could uh, within seconds be missing fingers. Yeah, but, but let me first one little point here. I grew up in a very traditional Orthodox home, and I never, you know, ate any kind of shellfish, obviously. But, you know, you know, I always hear this, especially from Jews who, do, who don't keep kosher, who didn't keep kosher. They tell me, the shrimp, the lobster is the most delicious thing in the world. Is you, they, 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 People go crazy. Lobster is so good. They wear special pajamas to wear it. They dip it in <laughs> butter. They, to me, it looks like a big cockroach. I mean, frankly, it's a- it looks... There's nothing more disgusting than a lobster. It's, it does. If I see a lobster, I want to call an exterminator. And not only that, they, they, they serve like the whole thing. It's not like they chop it up. You don't know what the heck it is. They serve the whole big disgusting thing. So for me, if I was going to touch an animal, I would never touch one of the, the, the these kind of shrimps or something like that. Because to me, it's just absolutely, blah, absolutely outrageous. So I look at it, observe it, but I would never want to touch any kind of uh, shellfish, any kind of any of these kinds of fish. So I, but we don't we don't really touch things. That's not really done. It's it's we're there to observe and mm-hmm. to look at and feel very privileged to do that. But to touch, we don't touch animals. I mean, and unless are, it's very usual. If you are going to play rock paper scissors with an animal, this wouldn't be the one to play with. Right? No, no. <laughs> You don't think it's it's a, it is a delicacy. So apparently there is there's a delicacy, of course, in China and Japan where they eat everything, including their grandmothers. I don't know. They eat weird <laughs> things, there, but the the uh, they they eat this. You know, whatever. Oh, they, they are plentiful. They they're found only in in the area of what's called the Indo Pacific, which is the area where the in the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean meet. That's where you have the greatest biodiversity, not just under the waves. I, I'm sure your listeners, you know, read about a new a new animal, a new mammal that was found. It's usually going to be in a place like Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Aside from the fact that Indonesia is made up of some 3,000 islands, some of them, you know, just humans have never been there. So that's where they're finding all these outrageous variations in, in, in creatures. Um, my, uh, uh, as I was searching through um, uh, Tovia's um, amazing pictures and I was finding a little bit of film footage to throw in, um, I found out that cuttlefish can't see underneath them. But they react to the ground that's underneath them when they camouflage. So they're not camouflaging themselves to what they can see. They're camouflaging themselves to what they're sitting on. And as their eyes are on top of their body, nobody can understand how they camouflage themselves to what they're on. Oh, my goodness. And they do it in the dark. (laughs) No. No, no. Yeah, so they can put them into laboratory circumstances where they black out all natural light. They can put them onto a color. And they'll still camouflage themselves to what they're on, even though they can't physically see it. And even if there was light, they they still can't see what they're on. I have never, ever considered that before. And you've just totally blown my mind because now I'm thinking, how how do they register the colors and, and, and that, that, they're, that they're engaging with? Toby, you must have an answer to that, surely. No, it, it's, it's done by a chemical reaction. I, I should just begin by saying that although when we speak about cuttlefish, which are in, in which is an invertebrate, as being among the most intelligent invertebrate, we are not. We're not. They're not competing. I mean, you wouldn't have a cuttlefish do your tax return. 
So <laughs> yes, they're not that intelligent, you know. So what what's happening is the 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 color changes in its in its pigment is done by a, a reaction from a re, from reflective chemicals that are underneath its body that changes the pigment cells. Uh, and and by the way, it's so tight on a cuttlefish that the changes happen. The changes, the variations take place in an area that's smaller than a square millimeter. So the is very, very exact. Um, so, I mean, that would correspond to an area, uh, that would correspond to about uh, about 359 DPI. It's uh, incredible. So they, there, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a biological reaction reaction to the pigment uh, that, that it's whatever it's on the body responds, but the animal's not thinking about it. The animal's mm. not going, okay, I'm I'm here. Let me do this. It's an automatic reaction, and it's almost involuntary. Where it it's does like a that computa- automatically? A computation. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't know why it's doing it or that it's doing it. It's just doing it. That right. blows my mind. I my no, no. <laughs> my mind is blown. <laughs> No, I never thought about that before. And then you just put that in my head like that? And I'm, I'm still, I'm going to be thinking about that all day. That just absolutely, I've never thought about it like that before. Yeah. My it's goodness. Uh, we, do yeah. Have, we do have an awesome creator. I want, we have to go to Ezekiel chapter 47 because we told the listeners we were going to do that. It's, uh, let, me, let me read it again. I'm going to read from uh, 7 to 10. It says, when I returned, Ezekiel says, when I returned, there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley, it enters the sea. And when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. And there will be a great multitude of fish, a great multitude of fish, because these waters go there, for they shall be healed. And everything will live wherever it goes. It shall be that, I think (laughs) last week I read, it shall be that scuba divers will dive in it. Now, I'm not adding to the text. Clearly, that's not there. I was just having a little bit of a joke. (laughs) It says, it shall be that fishermen will stand uh, by it from En Gedi to En Eglaim, and there will be places for spreading their nets, and the the fish there will be uh, the same kind of fish of the Great Sea. Now, I'm assuming that is the Mediterranean Sea, exceedingly many. Tobias Singer, what can you tell us about this passage? Well, this is fantastic. So just for your listeners to understand, you could take the book of Ezekiel and divide it into three parts. We're now very, we're in Ezekiel 47, which is the second to the last chapter. Mm-hmm. We are in the midst. We are, we are swimming, excuse the pun, in messianic prophecy. Mm. The messianic segment of Ezekiel begins at chapter 34, and it just spins and spins and spins, valley dry bones. Of the war of Armageddon or the the war of the nations that are coming up against Jerusalem mm. 38 39 the description of the third and final temple from 40 really till 46 and then it explodes at 47 describing how the how Jerusalem and Israel returned to a state of perfection and 48 is outrageous what we're now focusing on is the last segment beginning essentially in Ezekiel 34 and moves all the way through 48. That is entirely messianic. Mm. And so these are all messianic passages, and they describe the Messiah quite vividly. He's discussed, he's, he's called the Prince, and he is mentioned 17 times in these passages, which is very, very unusual. Now, when we get to Ezekiel chapter 40, we get to Ezekiel chapter 47, we're right now in the midst of the third temple. And in order to understand these passages, we have to look at the opening passage. The opening passage describe the opening passages describe the water that's springing out from underneath the temple. We know what that water is, and in fact, it was discovered just in recent years. The water springs out directly from underneath the Holy of Holies, right from underneath the Temple Mount, and then it shoots down south, just so people know what south is. If you're looking, if you're standing in front of the Western Wall, so you're facing east, so it just drops down to the right, which slopes Mm -hmm. all the way down into what's called the City of David. 
Mm-hmm. Those waters gush out of the uh, out of the Temple Mount itself and is poured down beautifully down the uh, down that that the southern entrance, and then keep flowing down down into the city of David today. We can. One of the most popular sites that people go to is to walk knee deep in the waters that you are describing right now. And these are waters that emerge from the temple. Now, there is a mikvah that we know of that's been written about extensively. A mikvah means a place where people immerse themselves, Mm -hmm. which no one could find. No one has found since the first temple. And two brothers... Um, two brothers decided that they wanted to try to discover where uh, where this mikvah, this place of immersion is, where it goes so deep that it goes over your head. Mm. They wanted to find out where where this was. So one brother actually tied a rope around the other. He went beneath the water, and of course he had a signal for how many tugs, and then found the, what's called the Shiloach, and that's the place where King Solomon was anointed uh, when King David was on his deathbed. That's where kings were anointed, and it was all discovered. So today, it's a, a fabulous area of uh, of archaeology. Today, one can go see it there. I personally immersed in that mikvah, in that that area where you go. You know, it's, it's knee deep, but if you find that right spot, it's uh, all the way taller than a hu- human being. That also is thought to be the place. Thought to be, I should say that, to be the place where Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant. Although we can't be sure, that is the most likely area where it's really? it hidden. So right there we have the flowing waters that go right down the south. Now, this all ties together because during the festival of Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, that's when instead of the wine libation on the altar, there was a water libation that was poured on the altar, and that's where the water was carried up from, from that area. And of course, that all, now, that all ties together with Zechariah 14, because it tells us that in those days, and uh, at the end of days, the nations that will choose the God of Israel, together with the Jewish people, will celebrate the festival of Sukkot, Sukkot the festival yeah. of tabernacles. Mm-hmm. So it all ties together. The water, which is poured on the altar during the Sukkot, which represents mercy. Um, the, the, the nations who, the, the Gentiles who choose the God of Israel, as opposed to those who come to war against it, they will, they're what's called Gagu Magog. And the word Gag in Hebrew means a roof, a roof. Mm-hmm. That's what the word Gog means is a roof. So the people of the roof, which is very odd, but in reality it makes all the sense in the world. Those There are two kinds of people. Those who trust in the roof, that means in a, mad, ma- in a man-made concrete hardened uh, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. cover, shelter, and those who don't trust in the roof, in something of this world, but they trust in the clouds of heaven. They trust in God's glory, and those are the two opposing forces. And that's why in Daniel 7, uh, in Daniel 7, 13, it says, the, it describes the Messiah coming on the clouds of heaven to those who are faithful. Why is he coming on the clouds of heaven? Because it's those who are faithful trust in the clouds, not in the roof. So you have the people of the clouds versus the people of the roof who trust in this world. And therefore, in Zechariah 14, what do we discover? That Jew and Gentile together worship the one God of Israel, because that's the essence of the Messianic age. And what do they do? They go into a sukkah, into that booth. And what mm-hmm. is the essence of that sukkah? The schach, the covering, which represents the clouds of glory. So what we have here is this is all mercy. This is all in those who trust. And these are the great waters that stream down from the Temple Mount. So and this is, that's amazing. Those, so what are you telling me? Is, if I can, sorry to interrupt you, sure. but uh, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around this. You're telling me that they have detected a, a, a great reservoir of water under the Temple Mount. And, uh, and they believe this is... Uh, what will be the the water, the living waters that flow from out from underneath the temple all the way down uh, to the Dead Sea? Is that, is that right, correct? Right, that's correct. It's not they think. It is. Um, it's not they think. It's rushing, raging water. I encourage the listeners, when you're in Israel, go to what's called the City of David, which is just south. If you walk out of what's called Dung Gate, 
uh, mm-hmm. which is the normal, well, one of the major entrances. It's the one right off the side of the Western Wall. Uh, and you go down to the city of David, which is around the corner. You yes. will find there what's called Hezekiah's Tunnels. Hezekiah's and Tunnel, those yeah. were what was used to bring water up into Jerusalem during the siege of Assyria. You can walk knee-deep. This is a big tour. This is not like... So people walk through there. Thousands of people go through there every day. And then there's this one place, only one place, that is large enough for a... This is where the high priest went into a it's not carved into it's just a a a a place where it just goes right down it's not Mm -hmm. it's about seven feet tall where you just immerse yourself in the mikvah and this was the mikvah of the high priest he was discovered by two brothers uh, those who know the city of david and incidentally you can go on a website for the city of david i don't know the name of the website but his name is the man who really was the was the one who liberated the city of David. His name is Davidullah. He's a very unusual man. It's his two sons who now live on the Mount of Olives, all the way on top of the small Jewish community. These two mm-hmm. brothers, one went underneath with a rope tied to his leg because he was going in the water underneath stones. And mm-hmm. there was a, a signal they had where two, pl- two, two tugs, get me out of here, one tug, I'm fine. And he kept going on the rock until he found it. Today, this is seen by thousands of people a day. The water gushes down from the Holy of Holies, from a spring there, and just shoots down south, right through the Kidron Valley, south, south, until the Dead Sea. This is so not when uh, my, my, my wife, Hani, when she went to Israel, she, did, uh, she went through Hezekiah's Tunnel. She said it was one of the, the, the greatest highlights uh, of, of, the, of her trip. We did go there in March, and we went to the City of David and, and uh, on the tour with Keith Johnson and myself. And uh, we did go to the City of David. We didn't go into Hezekiah's Tunnel because we weren't suitably attired. But maybe this coming March, we may do that. Now, I, I, don't, I think I, because I'm, I'm six foot five, Toby, or I don't know. I think I, I'm going to have to sort of crouch down to get no, through no, there. No, no, you won't. You won't. It's, won't? Not, it's not a tunnel. It's, it's quite tall. Uh, Is it really? Yeah, that means well, it's, it's tall. It's just a very narrow uh, crevice in the rock. When I say no, any person can fit through, but there's no height restriction. I mean, I don't, I don't recall offhand how tall it is, but okay, it's, okay. It, it's we way may, up there. You're not going to have... Uh, you're not gonna we have may have to there. add it to the list. We may have to add it to the list on the tour to go through Hezekiah's Tunnel. That's, that's happening, by the way, dear listeners, in March. There are still seats available on that tour, and you can, uh, you can look into that by going to truthtoyou.org, truthnumber2letteryou.org, clicking on the picture of Keith and myself on the right-hand side. It'll take you to the details. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned this as a, uh, a, obviously a messianic, uh, as, as full of messianic prophecies, from, uh, particularly from 40 and on to the end. Can, I, can we clarify that a bit? Because obviously Ezekiel is about the restoration of Jerusalem, the temple, the priesthood, uh, and the Messiah and the, the king. In fact, the prince at the end of, and I think many of your listeners will find this very strange and striking, but you have the sin sacrifice returning. Christians struggle with this a little bit because uh, in, in the Hebrews and Romans, it, it would appear that the, the, the sacrifice the system would come to an end. But in fact, it is returning. The sin sacrifice is returning, for, which is a sacrifice for unintentional sins. In fact, if you look at Ezekiel 45, verse 20, 21, 22, you'll see there that, in fact, the prince, the Messiah, brings a sin offering on behalf of himself and the people does. for sins that are committed unintentionally. Naturally, in, in a Jewish model, this makes complete sense. People still will be human, will make mistakes of errors in the Messianic age, but there won't be no, there will be no rebellion in the Messianic age. So we so, see the end of Ezekiel 45 sacrifices, sin offerings, the Messiah himself will bring, and why he's bringing it is because of unintentional sins. We see in Isaiah 46, verse 16 and 17, that the Messiah is going to have children, a family, sons. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, we see it there as well. And here we see the world coming to a state of perfection. But the, the waters, it, it's interesting, in the old days, the, the people who deny the Bible, who are opponents of Scripture, uh, you say, well, where are Hezekiah's tunnels that are discussed extensively where water was brought in? And then they discovered it. The British, of course, took the plaque and it's sitting in the British Museum. So they have a, uh, an alternative one. They created a replica of it. But uh, the tunnels are there, the water that explodes, I mean, really explodes mm. out of that area uh, is uh, you can walk right through it. You should have water shoes on. It's a little mm. cold, but it's absolutely 
brilliant. So you need, yeah, you need to wear your Crocs or you need to wear yeah, some, yeah, exactly. some flip flops or something like that. You need water pre- shoes to walk. I mean, to, you, know, you, you don't want to wear patent leather, you know, tuxedo shoes. No, <laughs> no that would be a good idea. Now, the, the, now, it does, now, you mentioned it does refer to the prince, and you said that's in reference to the Messiah. And if we go back to Second Samuel chapter 7, we see that the, the everlasting kingship, if you like, the kingdom, is through David and Solomon. Is that fair? That's correct. But yes. there, there are some people, uh, Rabbi, who say that how can that be the case? Because we know that Solomon's reign came to an end, that there was the division, that there was the exile, that there's no one sitting on the throne at the moment. Therefore, how can it be a prophecy about Solomon? What, how would you answer that? Well, first of all, it's very clear that it is. I mean, that's, that's, that's not open to debate because it says the one who will build this temple in my name. So we know quite clearly it is Solomon. Mm. In fact, the kings that followed, where there is and you go further on to Yota, Uzio, Yotam, they were all descendants of King Solomon. So, in fact, we, we know that. Uh, the reason people are confused about Solomon is that in, in, in Kings, uh, we have this disaster with Solomon in chapter 11. You know, we, I, I don't know about you guys, I'm sure we all love Solomon, you know, but there's an ambiguity of what happens to him because he married women that would bring idolatry mm-hmm. into the temple. But we have very clearly in Chronicles showing that it is Solomon that the line goes through. The promises made very clearly that he will be to me a son, I will be to him a father. Mm. And it's not that he won't make mistakes. Because the text, again, these are not my words, but the, the text clearly states that if he sins, I will punish him with the rod of men, but I will not remove the kingship from him as I did from his predecessor. Now, this, these texts, these promises, just like we have in, in Genesis uh, 49, verse 10, does not mean there would never be an epic where there would be no king. What it's saying mm-hmm. is if there was going to be a king, or all legitimate kings would have to come from this line. So, for instance, there was a, a, a period of Babylonian exile, 70 years, there obviously was no king, and there was no king during the second temple period. There, there was no king except... But the Maccabees, we just celebrate Hanukkah, but the Maccabees who reigned, the, the Maccabean period reigned for about 103 years. With, the Hashemanian dynasty. Yeah, but they mm. actually in, inappropriately assigned for themselves, not the, the father, but as they went on, they assigned for themselves a, a position of, of kingship, which was inappropriate, and therefore they suffered, and there's no one left of their descendants today, but they were Kohanim, they were priests, and therefore mm-hmm. had no right to the kingship. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. So when, when we read in, uh, just returning to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, which you mentioned, verse 24 and on, it says, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and obey my statutes and do them, and uh, then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. My, my, forever. my servant David shall be their prince forever. forever. Now, when it talks about David being their prince forever, is it talking about a descendant of, of yes. David, or is it? It means that it is a, an heir to the covenant that God made with King David. It doesn't mean that king david will uh, somehow like what do they have in the hindus or were reincarnate he's not going to reincarnation of david what it means is that this individual who is not only a descendant of king david but will sit on the throne of david as a result of the promise that god made to king david and uh, and incidentally what we see there in the text is and and it's important to remember in is that all Christians agree that these are messianic passages and this mm-hmm. text is referring to the Messiah. There's, there is no alternative reading of that. Interestingly, it says there that this is clearly talking about the Messiah in the messianic age. It says that in that time, uh, they will have one shepherd and they will follow the mitzvahs, the commandments of the Torah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that, that's so the prince that we read there in, in chapter 37 is a descendant of David through uh, Solomon, as we see in Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and on. Therefore, when we get to uh, Ezekiel 45, as you mentioned, uh, we see the prince offering a, a sin sacrifice. We're definitely talking about the Messiah, the king. Right, that's correct. 
Okay. So that, I, I suppose that is a, uh, I mean, Christianity, I suppose, goes into damage control when they see that, because in that theology, how does a prince have to make, how does the Messiah have to make a sin sacrifice? In fact, if I go to my, because I'm reading from my New King James listeners, know that I, I read from the New King James uh, Study Bible, the Nelson Study Bible. What I have here in, uh, and this is the note on 44 verse 3, where the, where the prince is introduced. In that uh, study note, it says the prince. The identity of this prince is unknown. The Hebrew term does not always mean a king or a member of, of royalty. It is not the Messiah. Get that right. It is not the Messiah, since 45 verse 22 indicates that this leader must make a sin offering for himself. What they're doing is, I'm not saying this in a derisive way, but they're, they're walking it backwards in physically and spiritually. They're going, I have to end up at this goal, and the goal is it can't, the Messiah, Jesus, can't bring a sin sacrifice on behalf of himself and others. There is a complete division among commentators of who the prince is, but you, this is perfect. Because the ones who say this is not the Messiah, which is a very, would be, I mean, who else could this be? We saw there, David, my, my, the, the prince, will be, who, will, you know, who will lead over them, right, in 37. That's clearly speaking about the Messiah. If you go back in your commentary, I don't have it in front of me. I'm sure it's going to say that. So what they do is they, they can't have the, Jesus bring the sin sacrifice, because after all, Jesus was sinless. The hmm. Messiah is sinless, so that's not possible. So therefore, they have to either reinterpret what it says earlier, or just say, we don't really know who it is, but isn't that strange? I mean, here we have from 36 it's, to 47, we have 17 times this one individual who's so important, he's able to go into Aries Temple, no one else is the most prominent individual, and it's not the Messiah? I mean, who really no, is No, it's, it? it's amazing. So, And you're absolutely right when you say, if I go back to uh, 37 uh, and verse 24 and on, if I look at the study notes there in my New King James Study Bible, it says, the title David my servant refers to the Messiah and King who would come from David's exactly. line to save Israel, and it references Second Samuel chapter 7, verses Bingo. 8 to 16. But when you go a couple of chapters further, well, this right. can't possibly be him. Right, and, but, but at least they're being honest. That means they're saying the reason it can't be him is not because the text doesn't su suggest it. It can't be him. Because we're starting off with the postulate that we got to believe in Jesus, and we have to believe in the we have to believe that Jesus was sinless and couldn't possibly bring an animal sacrifice. And Hebrews saying the animal sacrificial system really was never efficacious, never really wor worked. Hebrews nine twenty two, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hebrews ten four five six, and so on. So they're working it backwards. Instead of saying, "Okay, let's figure out who this could possibly be," they're not. They're saying we we have to start off with the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He died for our sins, and he's the final sacrifice for all times. Hebrews ten eighteen, and therefore we have to reinterpret Ezekiel based on Hebrews, which is. So, you know, but the question is, why are there sacrifices returning no matter who it is? I mean, let's just concede everything. So it's obvious the prince is the Messiah. But let's say we ignore that. Why would a sin sacrifice be returning in the Messianic age no matter who you, you... Let's say we say the prince is the janitor. Why would he be bringing a sin sacrifice? And incidentally, you can say it's a lot of the folks like Matthew... Not Matthew Henry, but I forget the name. A lot of premillennial dispensators say, well, it's a more a Schofield. It's a memorial to what happened in the past. But if actually, if you go to the text... You'll see there in 20 through 23 that, in fact, that sin offering was brought for what? For unintentional sins, sins mm -hmm. that were committed unintentionally. They're not mm -hmm. brought as a memorial to anything. Mm. So, so, uh, so, Rabbi, this is, I mean, this is problematic for, for Christian theology, obviously. But, but if, if we, and, and you mentioned Paul, and Paul mentions that Jesus was born according to the flesh of the line of David. Uh, and if we go to uh, Matthew chapter 1, if we jump into the New Testament, we go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 11, I think it is. No, verse 6, it does tell us that uh, Jesus was born uh, in the line of David and Solomon. So we're, we're winning there, right? I mean, this, is he still in the running? Well, you know, in, Matthew opens with the genealogy, and it's very clear in Matthew 1 that it starts with, this is the first verse, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. So hmm. Matthew is setting, we don't, by the way, we don't know who wrote Matthew, but whoever wrote it, now it's called Matthew, uh, hmm. is trying to demonstrate that Jesus was eligible to be the Messiah because here's a genealogy. It's a, it's a 41 generation genealogy. It's very problematic. There are, in order to get his genealogy going and to get 14, 14, 14, names have to be stripped from that genealogy. But setting that aside, 
only two books in the New Testament, the two writers in the New Testament, claim that Jesus was born of a virgin. That's Matthew and Luke. Each of them have a very different plot device to get them born of a virgin in get him born of a virgin in Bethlehem. But the key point is, if Jesus was born of a virgin, then the genealogy is irrelevant because that irrelevant. genealogy is the genealogy of Joseph, and therefore, hmm. in point to if he's born of a virgin, Joseph is not related to him. Now. Some Christians say, well, Luke is the genealogy of Mary. It's not in the text at all. That doesn't exist. They mm. just have to come up with that. In fact, you look at Luke one twenty-seven. it's jo Joseph that was in the line of David, not Mary. So therefore, these genealogies are completely but, irrelevant but Luke, once you insert Luke the doesn't have birth. Luke doesn't have, uh, doesn't have Solomon. So, so we're at a loss there. We can't use Luke. Uh, it's Matthew that has David and Solomon in, in, the, right. in the genealogy. You know, Matthew's genealogy is also quite impossible. There's too few generations. If you look from Jaconia, Jaconia was, uh, let's say, died in the year about 612 BCE. So from 612 BCE, Matthew assigned 13 generations to Jesus. Talking about over 600 years, to have 13 generations, that would mean the average generation of person was having a baby around the age of 50 years old. So there's so many names that are stripped out, even hmm. if we were to concede, because obviously the last segment are unknown names, uh, it would be impossible to cover 600 years and 13 generations, particularly in a time when the average human lifespan was maybe 25, 26 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible on, on many different levels. Luke's genealogy in chapter 3 is at least more extensive with 56 generations. So in a sense, it's more plausible. Matthew's genealogy is impossible. Well, you mentioned you mentioned uh, Jeconia or, or Kaniah, as some people say, and that, that takes us back to Jeremiah chapter 22, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, Jeremiah 20, Jeconia only reigned for three months. He was referred to as the Jewish Caligula. He was so wow. evil, so wicked, that Jeremiah cursed him that none of his seed would ever sit on the throne of David. In fact, the person who will rule after him is Yehoyachim, instead of Yehoyachin. It's an M at the end instead of an, an N or a mm -hmm. Mem. That's his uncle, his father's brother, in order to bypass the curse. And then it continues down there to Tzitkiyahu. So therefore, the curse creates a, a staggering problem because if, in fact, this is the genealogy of Jesus, then he's not eligible to be the Messiah because of the curse on Jaconia. Now, I, I debated a Christian once, I man, I, I really respect, and, and uh, I raised this issue, and he responded, and Josh McDowell does the same thing in his book, Evidence of the Man's Verdict, and says, aha, that's the reason why you need a virgin birth, because if Jesus <laughs> wasn't born of a virgin, he would have been the descendant of Jaconi, and therefore ineligible to be the Messiah. But that's if, in fact, that's the case, then why introduce the genealogy altogether? That's not the genealogy of Jesus. It's, it goes back and forth, but uh, the verse that you're referring to is uh, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for none, none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. But I've had a lot of people say to me, what about King Zerubbabel? Ah, the, the answer is that there is no such thing as King Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, who is the, one of two leaders, Zerubbabel and Yeshua, Ben Yehotzadak of the two leaders that restore the second temple. And mm -hmm. the answer is Zerubbabel wasn't a king. He was a governor. So what you're saying is he never sat on the throne of David? No, he couldn't. And therefore, he's only a governor. He, the word King Zerubbabel doesn't exist, never happened in history. There were no kings during the second temple period. So he's a direct descendant of... Uh, can I have a uh, thing, but he never actually said so. We actually see it employed. No child of Yehoiachin Ye ever sits on the throne. It's his uncle, uh, it's his nephew, but never in descendant. And, and Zerubbabel, which literally that name means seated in Babylon, is not a king, he's a governor. I, I should mention the fact there is a Jewish tradition. Christians, strangely, although Christians uh, don't believe in the, in the Talmud and, and oral tradition, uh, they, they do appeal to an oral tradition on this thing. It really gets very interesting. So what happens, strangely, is that ordinarily Christians speak of the Talmud derisively, but when it, when, if it will save them, rescue them from a problem, from a conundrum, they'll appeal to it in a second. So sophisticated Christians will say, aha, but the Talmud says he was forgiven. That creates two monumental problems for them, if they want to appeal to the Talmud. Uh, the first problem is unbelievable, and that is, therefore, 
Jaconia was able to atone for his sin without shedding blood. He was able to atone for his sin using Christian terms by his own works, by something that he had done. And number two is we have here that the, the Bible says one thing. Scripturally, Jaconia is never restored. None of his children ever sit on the throne of David. So that means that if you have an oral tradition that even that contradicts what the plain text says, these Christians will say, we'll go with the oral tradition, even though it, it contradicts completely what the written text says, which, and, and of is, course, so which is astounding. And this is the case in uh, Manasseh as well, the, the son of uh, Hezekiah, who was so incredibly evil. He was, uh, he was exiled, and in exile, he repented uh, without, a, without being at the temple, without sacrifice. He, he, he repented and was restored and returned to the land. I mean, there too is equally a problem for them, but this is what they, what, what the Talmud is claiming happened for uh, Yechaniah. And this is what you're saying some Christians will lean on in order to get around the oh, yeah. problem of the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. But then once you do that again, you are building a case against the virgin birth. So it goes around and around. Well, the virgin birth is a latecomer to Christianity. The earliest Christians uh, didn't believe in a virgin birth. In the book of Mark, the earliest of the four Gospels, we're introduced to Jesus as an adult. There's no mention of Jesus being where he's born. There's no mention of... I mean, Mark didn't simply forget to mention that part. But the letters of Paul are much older than the Gospels. First Thessalonians being the oldest uh, from base, probably about 49. I mean, Paul didn't just forget to mention that part. It's all as, as a conversion of Jews to Christianity, and then it may not have been called that, but we'll just call Christianity, uh, will we'll basically end, and then it's almost all Gentiles. They're going to introduce ideas that are very well known in the pagan world, such as the virgin birth. And that's why we only find it in Matthew and Luke. In fact, the notion that Jesus was born in Bethlehem is only mentioned by Matthew and Luke. Very different descriptions of uh, a nativity uh, a narrative, mm. but they both look at having born of a virgin. John is so late that his birth really is relatively unimportant because John's prologue, John 1 through 18, is now going to have Jesus presenting Jesus as never before, as basically pre-existent. So, he, so John attempts to bypass these, uh, uh, the, these problems that, that appear in the genealogy. So this is fascinating. So this, I mean, okay, Mr. Spiritual Babies, you're absolutely silent. What, what's coming through your mind? Well, like the listeners, I'm just sitting back and soaking it all up. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, um, I have to say, I w- I've, I've gone through the Christian christian tradition um as a a, a a baptist in the uk it's not quite um it's a, it's a little bit different to maybe their own states and they don't tend to go towards the virgin birth um in a baptist church as as um as heavily as i've seen in, other, in some other movements and um, i think that's because they're trying to separate themselves a little bit from the kind of iconography that you find in catholic churches Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's it's interesting though because as uh, Tovia says, it's clearly a latecomer, uh, or, or so it would appear, because Paul, who was written vastly before, uh, uh, decades before the the Gospels, he, Paul says that uh, that Jesus is a um, a descendant of David according to the flesh, and so he he has no problem with that. It's not an and and it's strange, Tovia, that. Uh, what you have is the the genealogies, genealogies, and in both uh, gospels that have some kind of genealogy to to uh, tie together what what Paul has claimed, also then seem to want to negate that by adding the virgin birth story. It's it's a fascinating problem to try and solve. And uh, for many many Christians, when I when I mention things like this, they've never ever they never knew there was a problem there. They've never given it a second thought. They didn't realize that they had to play mastermind to make it all work. And uh, once you solve one problem, you've got another that you have to deal with. It's 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 very interesting. Yeah. Well, once you make one, if you have a perfect system, Torah is Hashem Tumimo, the Torah of God is perfect. If you take any perfect system and remove one piece, it has a ripple effect, which means you start spinning in circles. The virgin birth is an embellishment. I mean, you take Mark, which is the least embellished of the Gospels, not only do you have no mention of, of birth, as I mentioned, you're first introduced to Jesus at, at his baptism, where Jesus finds out he's the Son of God at that moment. Remember, there's a different heavenly voice in, in Mark and Matthew. In Mark, the voice says, you are my son, and on this day I begot you. So the voice is speaking to Jesus, informing him of his new status at the baptism. Look carefully at Matthew. It's different, because as you go later in time, Jesus 
becomes a uh, becomes a son of God at an earlier stage in his career. In Matthew, the, the voice says something that's slightly different. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Which means the voice now is not addressing Jesus. In Matthew, Jesus knows he's the son of God because he was born of a virgin. So who? this is my son, Jesus is now third person. He's informing the audience that is there around. John is so late, that, and meaning, and has Jesus as pre-existent that John, there is no baptism. Jesus is never baptized. That's fascinating. That's, that's fascinating. Well, I reckon we have, that's a lot to, to chew on. And uh, we, I think we better leave that with the listeners, but it certainly gives you an insight, some clarification coming back to uh, the latter chapters of Ezekiel as to uh, wh- who who this may be, or, or maybe more precisely, who it isn't. So uh, there's, there's something for the listeners to chew on. And I'm sure that the listeners will then have many, many questions Please, uh, Rabbi, would you be happy to answer listeners' questions? Yeah, in fact, if you'd like, do you know, if you'd like in the next show, I'm just saying this and we're doing this on air. <laughs> uh, if you want to, you're welcome to have listeners write in questions and then but don't tell them to me. And then on air, we can address them if you'd like to go down that road. I think, I think that would be a wonderful thing because undoubtedly there will be many, many questions after this program. And if we could, if we could, uh, if I could just make one request, if we could have a featured uh, creature, a feature creature, how's that? <laughs> uh, <Start> feature. Off, <laughs> I want an underwater feature creature every single program. If we could do that, one of your personal photos that you have taken in an explanation as you just did with that beautiful uh, lobster or whatever. The, 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 the mantis shrimp. shrimp mantis. Non-culture guys, stay away from me. <laughs> it's just the thumb crusher i'm about to put that up on facebook that image and an explanation of it it's really quite astonishing tovia singer is the uh, is the facebook page you'll find him there and uh, we'll put a link at the bottom of this page thank you so much rabbi tovia singer for coming back on the program mr spiritual babies thank you my friend and uh, until next week where we can discuss some of the listeners questions and a new feature creature a new feature <laughs> creature i'm gonna have to practice that good heavens that's a tongue twister in the meantime dear listeners <laughs> OutreachJudaism.org is the website of Rabbi Tibia Singer. OutreachJudaism.org, a plethora of resources found there. And uh, until next week, be blessed and be set apart by the truth of our Father's Word. Shalom. Shalom.